Thank you, Alex, for putting that video together. Much appreciated. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm super pumped up about the conference this year. Uh, this is our third annual conference, uh, our biggest conference uh, in San Francisco, our, kind of our hometown. And we had about a little over 100 people in our first conference uh, two years ago. We had about 250 people last year. We have over 400 people joining us today. So uh, thank you very, very much for attending. We think we have a great uh, conference for you as well. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors uh, that are listed on the placard over here. Uh, take a, uh, they have a booth uh, out in the hallway here, so uh, take a look at what they're up to and how they're working with us. Uh, we really appreciate the sponsors. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, all of you out there that are giving presentations, uh, uh, various speakers at Couchbase that are giving just uh, fantastic uh, presentations that we really, really enjoy them. Uh, the, uh, so there, there are a number of, of big customers doing really remarkable things in Couchbase. Uh, we've got uh, presentations by uh, companies like PayPal, associated with online payments, travel, uh, travel uh, applications. Uh, Orbis will be giving a presentation. Uh, Nielsen will be giving a presentation uh, on some uh, customer insight oriented use of Couchbase. So these are just three of the presentations that I think are, are really exciting and many more are being given by our customers. Uh, a lot of people doing big things with Couchbase. Um, we've got uh, one unnamed uh, customer that's uh, serving over a billion people a day. Uh, we've got uh, another customer uh, that is doing more, more than 1.8 billion investments per month. Uh, that's live person. They'll be talking uh, later today. And we have another uh, user, uh, Questpoint, that is doing more than 10 billion transactions per day. They'll be talking at the show today as well. So uh, a lot of exciting things at the show. We really appreciate uh, all of you in the community that are willing to uh, share with everyone else the use of Couchbase. I think you're doing some very remarkable things. So thank you very much for, for participating. For the rest of you who are in the community, uh, thank you as well. Uh, we're an open source community. We're very much committed to that. Uh, your contributions, whether it is contributing to the forum, uh, answering questions, or providing bug fixes to our SDK and our clients, uh, is all a big part of the open source community that we are continuing to build. So, very, very much appreciated. And for those of you who are new to Couchbase, welcome to the community. I uh, hope you learned a lot today. Uh, and become bigger and bigger uh, supporters and leaders in the uh, open source software. So thank you very, very much. Um, this is a good time for us to kind of look back at uh, what happened over the last year since we met a year ago. Uh, a year ago, we, uh, we had our big announcement was that we were going to beta with our 2.0 release. And the 2.0 release is really a critical release uh, for us. Uh, it really allowed us to move from being a key value database to a document database by providing extensions that allowed us to do things like indexing and querying based on uh, the JSON documents that we would store in the database. And that was really huge for us. It was huge for us in terms of really expanding the number of use cases that we could support. Uh, another capability that was a little bit less uh, well known as a part of that release, but still a very big capability, was the cross data center replication capability that allows uh, particularly big users of our software to mirror the database across uh, data centers and allow them to support global audiences of users of their web apps and their mobile apps. So that 2.0 release was really critical for us uh, in order to expand, again, the, the community and the use of the product. And, uh, and that 2.0 release has been incredibly successful. Uh, I hope you have all had a lot of success with it, uh, but from pretty much the moment that we released that in December of last year, uh, things just really have absolutely taken off. From a community perspective, our downloads increased by more than 3x. From a sales perspective, we are a business. Uh, our first half sales increased by more than 400% year over year. And obviously, that wasn't a comparison on small numbers. We, we already had uh, achieved uh, significant success in 2012. So this is a great indication just of the momentum that we've been able to build 
as a result of that 2.0 release. So uh, many of you, I think most of you probably have moved over to 2.0 or one of the subsequent minor releases. I hope you really uh, like that, uh, the, the, the growing capabilities that are a part of the product. And again, I thank you for being big supporters and helping us build this kind of momentum over the last year. Okay, um, and uh, uh, the, the other thing that's really changed over the last year is that obviously uh, NoSQL has continued to grow in a huge way. Uh, we continue to see just incredible growth of the industry that we're in. Uh, obviously, there are other players in this industry that are also delivering uh, 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 NoSQL technology, and we just see NoSQL absolutely taking off. One of the biggest changes that we've seen over the last 12 months has been that many big internet companies and enterprises have really gone from uh, experimenting with the technology. And by experimenting with it, I don't mean that it's just in the labs. They've used it on a number of applications. They may have used two or three different NoSQL products for different use cases and, and started to build experience with those technologies. But the big change that we started to see is that many of those big internet companies and enterprises are starting to um, uh, uh, make strategic decisions to deploy NoSQL technology on some of their most mission critical applications. And that means massive deployments of hundreds and thousands and even tens of thousands of nodes of the software. And we're seeing that happen in a big way. Accompanied with that have been massive, you know, very deep strategic evaluations of the various NoSQL technologies. And, uh, and so I see that as a big change. I think that that whole, um, uh, that happening is going to accelerate over the next year or two, and you're going to see just an explosion in the use of NoSQL technology. Uh, and so, so we do see enterprises uh, increasingly using NoSQL, and again, using it very broadly. We do see them increasingly using it on mission-critical applications that are absolutely fundamental to their business and a big part of their business. The other key thing that we're seeing is we're seeing significant replacements of the incumbent uh, relational technologies. We're seeing significant replacements of Oracle and DB2 and SQL Server and MySQL, just as a few examples, right? That was happening before, certainly, but on a much smaller scale than we're starting to see it happen now. And I think all of that is a testament to the technology development, the maturation of NoSQL technology, and the increasing confidence and, and comfort that big companies have with this technology. The good news also, and, and a, a key reason why Couchbase has been so successful over the past year, has been that in these strategic deep evaluations, we have done extremely well. We've done extremely well in large part because we have established a strong reputation for having really easy and reliable scalability and having consistent performances measured uh, by latency and, and throughput, uh, and by providing a flexible data model in terms of JSON. So, uh, so for many of you, hopefully you've seen those kinds of attributes in your own use of the product and your own evaluations and, and deep dives on the product. Uh, and from, from the team of, of Couchbase people that are here, we're working very hard to continue to enhance that and continue to provide uh, stronger and stronger capabilities to support your scalability needs and your performance needs and, and your overall uh, needs for a database. So again, we, we, we thank you for all of that support. <clears throat> now, um, we're, we're obviously not standing still. Uh, we are very, very aggressively developing a new technology. Uh, and certainly, uh, we started obviously again last December releasing 2.0. Uh, we released uh, 2.1 in June, and actually today we're releasing the 2.2 release, uh, which if you're interested in, you'll hear about um, in, in other sessions today. Uh, so we continue to polish and fine tune and continue to provide enhancements to the existing base technology. And in the future, in the first quarter-ish of next year, we'll provide a 3.0 release that will provide a next big wave of major functionality uh, that will be part of, the, of Couchbase server. So we're continuing to innovate and evolve the existing product, Couchbase server, that we have uh, very significantly. But we're also, today, I'm sure you've seen a lot of the signage 
uh, 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 around the, the conference center here, all referring to mobile. And that's our big strategy announcement today. Some of you may have seen uh, some of the press that already is coming out today about a major mobile strategy that we're announcing. Uh, and uh, like most people, obviously mobile is incredibly hot. It's the next major development platform. Whenever there's a major develop, new development platform, there's all kinds of change that takes place. There's all kinds of new technologies that are required in order to develop efficiently on those platforms. And so for the past two years, we have been noodling on and developing uh, mobile-based technology that we could deliver to, to the market. And uh, today is the day that we're formally announcing that capability. It's all open source, uh, and, and we've been doing a lot of this work out in the open uh, for the past couple of years, but, but today is the day that we're formally announcing it and saying that we're ready as a company to take this to market. So uh, to tell us more about how we uh, see the, the world, the application development world evolving over the next few years, and more specifically, uh, what our mobile strategy is all about, I'd like to introduce uh, Raheem Yassin. Everyone calls him Yassin, uh, and he's going to talk to us about our, our mobile strategy and uh, uh, take it from there. Thank you, Bob. Good morning, and welcome to the conference. Um, we're going to have many presentations today, great customer presentations, and a lot of presentations on our product, uh, couch-based server, cross data center replication, um, all our mobile stuff, uh, the SDKs, um, and, and other things. But in this session, I'm not going to talk about the details of our couch-based server or some of those products. What I'd like to do is take a walk through history. We look at data in the past, in the, today, and, and, and the future. And then we'll do a very, uh, what I think is a very cool demo on mobile at the end. So data. Um, I said if I'm going to talk about data, um, let me look at wiki. This is the definition of data on wiki. And uh, my first reaction was data, huh? It's really, really boring, really, really dry. It talks about qualitative and quantitative variables. It talks about rows and columns. I'm pretty sure some relational guy wrote this, right? So what I'd like to do is revisit this definition for the next few minutes. Um, an interesting anecdote here is that I was in the dentist's office the other day, and my dentist asks me, what do you do? I said, well, I'm in software, and we manage data. And the response I got was, data, huh? So that's the kind of response that we tend to get when we talk about data. But I, I don't think that's what data is about. I think we've got it wrong a little bit. And uh, at the end of the session, either you'll agree with me or not. But, but, but let's see how it goes. There's this interesting site called ChronoZoom. And uh, everybody can see this. It's, it's a little choppy there, but, that, but that's fine. Um, it's got a timeline at the top, and it talks about how you can zoom into history. We'll do a little walk through history, and then we'll do a little walk through data. This is about 200 years, and is about the United States, right? There is, um, there is. Uh, I'll manipulate this a little strangely. Um, this is University of California, Berkeley. I think these are the guys that built this site, um, and Microsoft. The birth of the internet is somewhere here, and uh, I'm going to zoom to the period in history that we call humanity. And you got to watch the zoom. I'm going to go up here, and I'm going to do humanity. 
and that's just amazing. This is the period in which all the great civilizations were created, about 5,000 years of history, right? Um, you'll, see, um, you'll see Babylonian history, Roman history, Iberia and Spain, Mayan history, Greek history. That's 5,000 years of what we call humanity, when we were civilized, so to speak. Now I'm gonna do one more zoom, and then we'll get back to data. This is prehistory, just watch that. That gives you a sense of scale. The, the, the bar at the top is now talking about kilo years. And if you keep zooming, and I'm not gonna do that, you can see mega years. So, there's, a, there's something we can learn from this history. And I'm gonna go back to my, my presentation. These are symbols from 30,000, 25,000 years ago. Looks like a Facebook page, but these are symbols. The interesting thing about these symbols is that they were seen across all continents, squares, checks. That was 25,000 years ago. This is data. This is an amazing drawing. It's bison in the caves of Altamira. 20 to 35,000 years ago. This finding alone changed our perception of what prehistoric human beings were. This is data. Looks like a pretty nice picture you can have on Facebook. More data. Mayan writing. This is about, now, now we're back into humanity. This is about 3,000 years old, right? And this writing is arguably one of the most striking visually striking writing systems of the world. This is data. Data is used to represent things that we intelligent human beings want to talk about or communicate. More data. Modern data. This is one year old. This is the latest in 3D dental x-rays. This is actually one of my x-rays. And interestingly, same dentist, when he shows this to me, I say, hey, doc, that's data. And then he gets it. He's like, oh, wow. He says, that's the stuff I said we like to work on and manage. And light bulb goes off. And he goes, what do you do with this? And I said, wrong question. I said, I manage the data. It's what you do with it. Right, and the same applies to all of you. We manage the data, you can do amazing things with it. And what this doctor did for me was, he found something with this 3D x-ray that had bothered me for two years. Let me now, thank you. Let me now walk you through what is the next step in data. It's about the recording of data. Right? What, whether you record data in a cave wall or on a stone, it's all about recording data. You want to write data and you want to be able to read data. There is nothing more basic than that. The basic elements of data haven't changed. Symbols, alphabets, pictures, they haven't changed. It's all about how you disseminate data. Another little history lesson, and I promise there won't be much more of it. Paper, 2 BC. Probably one of the greatest inventions in recording data. The printing press in, is, in my view, the Gutenberg Press is arguably the biggest single innovation in recording data. I think, in my view, it far outstrips the internet. From a period of 1450 to modern computers in 1950, that's what 500 years. The, the printing press, even today, continues to be the dominant way to record and disseminate data. This is how we got to be a literate world. So anybody that tells you that what we do today is great, I say, look at the printing press. If you ask me to take a printing press or a relational database, I know where my vote goes. 
So it, it, we have the potential to do more. Uh, the typewriter, uh, back, to the, back to the printing press for a minute. Just to give you an idea of scale, 20 million volumes were produced between 1450 and 1500 when the press first came out. If you just put that on a scale, that far exceeds the early impact of the internet. The typewriter, the PC, we're now at devices. The internet, in, and that arrow is not actually a good scale because there was 1400, there were, between the paper and the printing press, there were 1400 years. But not to sound you know, too pedantic, but the relational database hasn't been around for that long and what it's done for the last 35 years is record business data. Business data is not all the data in the world. So here's my take on data and the future of data. Data serves as the lifeblood of civilization. That's why I walked you through some of those things. It's what we use to in, as intelligent human beings to communicate, to express our thoughts, to express our ideas, and to learn to grow. It's no longer just business or enterprise data. It's personal, it's social. And I think we have not yet seen the intersection of human and machine data. Uh, somebody yesterday told me about a, a, an innovation in medicine where you'll swallow something the size of a pill and it'll have a wireless transmitter that transmits to a device that will tell you what's happening inside your body. The days of invasive surgery to look at stuff is probably fading. Um, so what kind of data are we talking about? Most of the data I showed you was unstructured or semi-structured. It's not that wiki definition. It's not rows and columns and sets. That's just business data. Search will seamlessly complement query. That's why I think Google does a great job of search. And everybody looks at data through, through the lens of search. But for us, I think search will complement query. Uh, when you have a chance, in one of our other sessions, please check out we have some early work on a query capability that we are calling Nickel. Check that out. It's pretty cool. I think you also have a, a data sheet in your, in your bag on Nickel. On two sides, we talk about how we can do more than just, more than just regular queries. Uh, pattern intelligence, finding patterns in data will be what the new data intelligence will be. You know, classically, business intelligence was about writing reports and looking at trends. I think we're, look, we're going to look for patterns. And I would, never, I would never, never doubt the amazing power of data to disrupt. It's what, what we have seen for thousands of years. So I, I think the next thousand years, we don't know how we're going to record data. It might be holographs. It might be something else. But it will change. What's even more interesting is that TV shows like Numbers and Person of Interest are also focused on data. When you see that, you know that data is now mainstream or big data. Uh, the general population is starting to understand the power of data. So what's our opportunity here? And when I say our opportunity, I'm referring to yours and ours. There is a $35 billion database market that's on traditional technologies. I believe that by 2027, most of the database growth will be about capturing those things that are not rows and columns. Relational databases are great. I spent a long time at Oracle. I love that stuff. It just doesn't do what we need it to do to do all these other things in data. We see three trends today. Cloud computing, big data, big uses. Big data is nothing more than our ability to record more of what's out there. It's not, we, it's not something new. It's just the data has always been there. It's really our ability to record it. Big uses is about accessibility to data. The printing press allowed some amount of accessibility, 
the internet is what gives us a large user base. We think that there is a next generation database that's going to solve some of these problems. I, I wouldn't say all of them because the problem is really, really big. And we think that's no SQL, we think that's Couchbase. So what I think all of you have to do is you have to imagine new applications. I do not believe in and I do not think we just take some old application that was written in a relational database and try to rewrite it. That would be pointless. You have to imagine new applications and create new markets. So you may ask, what does that mean? What that means is we have reimagined the point of sale. IBM started its life with a business machine that did cash registers, an NCR, a company that's long gone. This is the new point of sale. Reimagining music, you know, you've got to give Steve Jobs credit for doing a fantastic job of, of rethinking this industry. Long gone are the CDs, and it's all replaced by, by a scheme where you discover music through friends, through experts, through streaming, through social stuff. Calling a cab, you just do that from a device. F finding parking, that's changing too. You'll have sensors, devices, sensors on parking spaces. Um, I often wonder when you walk into a garage and they tell you how many spaces are available, are they guessing or are they calculating? And I don't know, but it's an interesting you know, idea. The reimagination of travel and travel expenses. And this is one of my favorites. One of our customers, Conquer and Tripit, do a great job. And um, I really like using this app because it makes my life simple. You know, long gone are the days of pasting receipts on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. It used to take me hours. Anybody that has used an Oracle or an SAP travel management tool, I think you, you've gone through that. With, with Conquer and with Tripit, it's really, really, really easy. And reimagination of healthcare. Um, I have a key engineer, Matt, whose wife works as, a, as, as, as an RN, and he gave me this idea that there is a workstation on wheels. I've seen these in hospitals. They wheel them around, and they're these massive PCs, right? I think there's going to be a device in the not-too-distant future where it's going to be able to do ultrasounds, it's going to be able to do x-rays, it's going to be able to... You'll, you'll have a port on your bed, on your hospital bed that just plugs into this device, and it's going to download all that stuff, all those biometrics, right, that are there. This is what I see happening today and happening in the foreseeable future. Um, I'm going to take you through a few example use cases where Couchbase dominates today. Just to give you a sense of the present. Session stores. One of our most popular use cases, Couchbase dominates this, this space, right? We Items in a shopping cart, flights, orbits, we'll talk about some of that stuff. We are really good at this today. We're not going to stop here. We're going to continue to do more, but we're good at this. Uh, Bob talked about globally distributed user profile stores, right? One of our customers is doing close to a billion user profiles. And if they can do that at scale, anybody else can do that. Content and metadata stores. Um, this looks like how we can bring all those pictures and images and all that stuff from civilization into a really nice database. I can't imagine storing this in a relational database. It's not a knock on relational systems. They are great. Their design point was business data, a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet that is a shared, distributed, across users spreadsheet. Third-party data aggregation, a very common use case. Pick your data because data gets generated everywhere.
Now I'm going to introduce mobile. This is for us, our new frontier. One more slide on history. Last one and we're done. This now traces applications. Applications from about the 70s to now. Applications started their life on mainframes, green terminals. And the people that had access to those applications lived in a building, in a glass room. Operators. We then went to the PC, the client server era, opened up a whole new horizon of things. Now we had hundreds of billions of users using monolithic, huge monolithic apps. SAP, Siebel, PeopleSoft, doing things like payroll, inventory management, CRM, what, what, what's usually called enterprise apps. And don't get me wrong, they, they opened the door compared to mainframes on something that became tremendously useful. Today, we talk about cloud and mobile devices as our platform. Trillions of things, billions of users, and millions of apps. What do these apps look like? They are small apps. You consume apps in small doses, like the app that lets you check into a flight and generate an electronic boarding pass. It's really easy to do that. You can do that in a taxi cab to the airport, right, if you have the right connectivity. Here is where I see the next generation of applications. And this doesn't even do justice. This is already here today. This is the future that's already here today. All of us are going to interact with many devices. Each one of us is going to carry more than one device. But in turn, you're going to interact with other devices. The example I gave of checking into a flight, generating an electronic boarding pass, when you get to the gate, you then interact with another device at the gate, and you just scan that barcode, if you will, or that, that electronic boarding pass. Um, these devices, you know, they do single-user interactions. They do multi-user interactions. They do group. They do social. Um, enterprises are moving to devices. You know, storage enterprises are moving to devices. And I think in things like... Um, like healthcare, in medicine, there are, there are already things that plug into the device that can, you know, do scans, that can do, you know, measure your blood pressure, uh, measure your sleep rhythms. This is just the beginning. So what I find very interesting is that there's an interesting trend here. There's, a, there's an incredible growth in the number of devices, but there's an even bigger trend. Each of these device hardware footprints are getting to be pretty big. You know, we're talking about quad cores, we're talking about eight cores, we're talking about 256 gig of memory, flash, maybe a half a tera. It's not, it's very foreseeable. When you have these devices and they get to be this big, what are you going to do with them? There's only one thing you can do with them. You put data on them and you run an application. At the end of the day, it's about data and applications. So I think that if I look at these devices, another trend comes to mind. I think that Google and Apple did something very, very innovative. They decided to build two modern lightweight operating systems from ground up. They didn't take some big, massive, existing operating system and try to fit it on the device. They didn't try to take Mac OS and put it on the device. And they were right. I think that Android and iOS are as important as Vax VMS when it was released you know, 30, 40 years ago. It's going to have the same level of importance. So we decided that it made absolute sense to build ground up a native database for Android and iOS. 
a database that will actually store all that data on the device. And it will be a NoSQL database, a couch-based database. I believe that if you look at this picture a few years from now, the amount of compute power that's at the edge may exceed that of server-based clouds. Just count the number of devices, multiply by the number of cores. I think the network that's formed at the edge might be the next cloud, but that's speculative. So what's our mobile strategy? JSON anywhere. A lightweight JSON database on the device, the first and only NoSQL database on the device. Nobody else has a JSON database on the device. JSON on the wire, which means a seamless transmission of data. I'm not talking about you know, the data formats that are used for packets, but I'm talking about the fact that you don't have to translate between relational and, and JSON or XML or something like that. You know, you can, you can ship the JSON data just by serializing it and you know, deserializing it at the other end. And JSON in the cloud. We already have you know, a very good JSON database on the cloud. And by doing this, it's a seamless experience. And we added a product called Sync Gateway. What it does is very easy sync. A few lines of code. There's a session that Chris is going to do later today that's going to show you how easy it is to write that sync code. Sync code is notoriously difficult to write. And this strategy took us some time to put together. But I think this is the future of data. You're at the edge. There are sensors at the edge. There are cameras at the edge. There's a GPS at the edge. There is medical gear at the edge. You can measure, you know, you can put that on a bridge, measure the vibrations on the bridge. You can do this smart device will make the PC look archaic in terms of computing power a few years from now. But I think I've talked enough. I think what we can, what, what, let me show you what it does. Let me get Wayne and Jans to come and show you an amazing demo that we did with this product. Jans, you have something cool you're gonna show us? We do, yeah. Okay. So, when we were planning how we wanted to unveil our new couch-based mobile product, we knew we wanted the initial demo to be fun and big. We eventually landed on the idea of taking a familiar game and giving it a little twist. The game we decided to go with is checkers. Now, this checkers game is a bit different than the one you'll remember. What we did was we based it on an idea we call world play. What this means is that everybody in the world plays the same game at the same time. That little twist gives us the opportunity to have big data and big users and to show you how to use our new mobile product to solve really big problems with ease. So, Jens, let's take a look. Okay, we can't hear you. Not a single player, but a team. I'm on the... We've got a, a red and a blue side, which are not single players, but just anybody in the world who wants to join one team or the other. I'm on the red team right now, so it's got my picture up there at the top. Okay, and so when a player um, chooses a team, that information is written into the local Couchbase Flight database. Our framework then synchronizes that automatically with the sync gateway and Couchbase database in the cloud. So uh, it's red's turn right now. So you can tell because the top bar is red and uh, got little outlines around the pieces we can move. So it just disappeared. Oh, it's because we were in the middle of it. Okay. So I'll make a move now. And uh, until the time counts down to zero, that's still provisional. We're not seeing your. It's on screen. Yeah, well, yeah we're, we're having, having a problem. problem. Yeah. Just maybe disconnect and reconnect. Oh, there, oh, we go. there you go. Okay. okay. So 
what happens here? It looks like we have some lag between the, maybe we switch sides. I, yeah, I think you need to be closer to the wireless. Yeah, so uh, at this point I've made a move and uh, some Couldn't other people other playing on the red team also made votes for their moves and the most popular move got applied by the server. So it's democratic checkers, basically. And so as, as the users, as the different players make their moves, and we've got some other guys in the audience playing, um, their data is then written to the, the move data is written to the local database. It's automatically synchronized with the cloud. The game server is listening to changes on the sync gateway and is controlling the gameplay. That data is also aggregated to create trending data, which is automatically synchronized back down to the devices, and that's what you're seeing with those arrows. So they're continuing playing. That's a good move. Now this is really powerful. From the client and server perspective, they're just working with local couch-based databases. And then the problem of synchronizing and getting data change notifications is just a feature of the database. So this takes a problem that's notoriously difficult and makes it really simple. So for example, Jens, how long did it take you to do the data part of this for the, for the game? It took like an half Took like an afternoon to write the code, so let's say four hours. It's so like four hours he did that by himself, and we spent the rest of our time just doing like UI code and figuring out what the rules of checkers were. So, yeah, it was pretty interesting. Okay. So, the game continues, and each team has their turn, and then eventually one of them has some big win. Um, we socialize that a bit by adding um, Facebook and Twitter posting right from the game. So you can take all the data from everyone playing. You can share that in real time with your friends. So he'll just tweet this out. And so with that, you've got a glimpse of our new um, Couchbase mobile product with Couchbase Lite and Sync Gateway. Um, I'm now gonna turn it back to Yasin. Actually, this game is also gonna be available for download on Monday in the App Store, and we're gonna release the source code. You can see exactly how we did it.